Uh, thank you very much and thanks for having me. Let me share my screen here. All good, I hope. Great. Um, so uh, thank you for having me today. I'm giving a talk called Breaking It Down and Building It Back Up Again. And it is an interesting talk to give because I usually talk about stuff I am, you know, at least closer to finishing. And now I feel like I'm in the very much midst of trying to scramble together pieces to make sure we have a, a successful fall semester. So some of the things that I'm going to uh, talk about are completed uh, mini projects as we transition this in-person course to an online course course and some of them are very much in progress and I'm happy to both answer questions and also gather feedback along the way. So uh, to give you a little bit of a background, um, the course that I'm talking about is called Introduction to Data Science. It is a 20 credit course um, at the uni uh, University of Edinburgh and it has no prereqs. So last year we offered this only to first year math students to keep the numbers uh, small, but this year uh, in the upcoming year, we're going to be opening it up to a much larger crowd. So we're expecting about 300 or so students in it. And obviously we're going all online. So um, everything that I'm going to be talking about, I can't sometimes help myself and say things like, uh, we're live or we're in person. What I mean is we're in a, a medium like this, um, as opposed to actually physically being in the same room. So let's talk a little bit about course content to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Um, so the course starts with an introduction to the toolkit. So we use R for uh, computing and everything is done version controlled via Git and GitHub. So students, we don't actually use the, uh, the learning management system at the university, but instead every homework assignment is submitted as a GitHub repository. So there's a little bit of a ramp up with like mini exercises to get the students warmed up to this. Um, and the first unit is about um, exploratory data analysis. So that's data visualization, data wrangling, um, and data importing. And so we do things like web scraping and whatnot here as well. And the second unit is a little bit more statistical, if you will. And this is where we do modeling and baby inference. Um, so simulation-based inference and some modeling. And then we wrap up week 11 at University of Edinburgh is a time when you're supposed to be uh, not giving kind of like assessed material per se. But uh, so I decided last year to use this as an opportunity to do more discussion. And also there's a project at the end of the course that I'll talk about in a bit. So this gives students some time to kind of uh, work on their projects too. Now, what, this was last year. So everything that's changing this year throughout the uh, slides is going to be in this burnt orange. Um, and so one of the things that's changing that actually has not, not, nothing to do with moving online, but something that I've been reflecting upon is that we do talk about data science ethics throughout the semester, but there isn't a clear focused module on it. At, uh, until the end and I felt like that might be sending the wrong message to the students. So I'm taking this opportunity of breaking everything down to actually insert this back into an earlier point in the curriculum right after web scraping because web scraping usually opens up a good opportunity to talk about should we be scraping that data in the first place so we can then go into a little bit more detail about uh, before they learn about modeling and things like uh, prediction and whatnot. Uh, what what do we need to think about about the data that we're working with uh, before they learn the uh, mechanics of how to do this sort of stuff. So that's going to be a full week earlier and on in the curriculum and the rest of the changes are really uh, just reordering the material for consistent weekly video length. So I feel like when I'm teaching in class, I can kind of calibrate things, add an example here or there, add an exercise here or there. So maybe every week I'm not necessarily talking the same number of minutes when we're actually in class, but I do feel like when you're going to be releasing videos to students, we want to try to keep them as consistent as possible. So I've been thinking about how do we chunk the weeks better so the, the content delivery feels like the same amount of material. This, I believe, uh, if successful, will be something that will be helpful when we go back in person as well. Um, so in terms of the weekly components, um, each of these little ticks represent an hour. 
and there are 13 of them. And if you ask me, do your students spend 13 hours on your class? Uh, if you ask them, my guess is the answer is going to be no. But with for a 20 credit course, that's about on average what's expected. So how do I anticipate that they filled this time? Uh, last semester was we had lectures twice a week and this was mostly content delivery. I do love teaching in an active learning style, but there was a lot new to me this year at the, my first year at University of Edinburgh. So we didn't do a whole lot of active exercises because I couldn't count on students having computers with them in class. There was also a once a week, two hour lab. This is where they work in teams and they produce an R Markdown report ultimately. Um, and um, they, these get submitted on GitHub. Other components of the class is an individual homework. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail of these uh, in each one of these. Um, a quiz that they take that are kind of code exercises and multiple choice questions. And then maybe self-study. They could come to office hours if they chose to. So that's entirely optional. There could be other stuff that they could be doing or more likely some of them not. Um, so how do we envision moving this uh, material uh, back to the class, uh, back to an online setting? So the lectures, the in-person lectures are not going to happen. And the way I'll be using this time is twofold. Um, there will be pre-recorded uh, videos for content delivery. These are done in shorter chunks. And my goal is to not exceed uh, an hour and 15 minutes per week of these. Um, that's still an exhausting amount of videos to watch, I think. So the goal is to try to keep it shorter, but also not to leave things out. Um, and I also hope to do these uh, weekly synchronous, but also recorded for students who can't make it, um, 15 minutes of state of the intradata science videos. And the idea is this would be the first 15 minutes of your first lecture of your um, week, for example. So recapping what happened last week, looking at how the assessments went that week and saying these might be the things uh, that you're confused about, maybe taking some live questions and then posting them after the uh, fact. So some things have to be recorded ahead of time, but other things are happening along with the class so it doesn't feel so dry. Um, the next thing I'll talk about is the homework. So I've been working on this. This is the bit that's actually a finished example. So one of the things that I was worried about um, moving online is how do we support the students so they don't, you know, I want to keep challenging them, but how do we support them along the way? They're not going to be just walking into office hours anymore. Um, the university is thinking about how to do things like, um, you know, group study and office hours, but I'm a little bit concerned with everyone being geographically distributed that we can do it as effectively. Um, so the homework assignments uh, used to look something like this. So you can see that Oops, sorry. So you can see that there's a lot of uh, instruction in them and the questions don't actually, they're just questions that we give them and they're supposed to explore based on what they've done in the lab and what we've done in class, figure out the R code for solving them. But you can see there's not a whole lot of guidance and the idea was that they ask questions on Piazza, ask questions to each other and kind of almost like struggle through them to get better. Um, but um, I feel like this may be a little bit too, um, too ambitious, where I may not be able to intervene as often as I would like. So what we've done is we've taken every single homework assignment and actually split it into two, what's called a pre-homework assignment, where we have these exercises built in Learn R. Um, that is going through the simpler stuff in a homework assignment, and you can see that students can actually write code in these interactive chunks and it will give them some automated feedback. So I'm making a distinction here between feedback and marking in the sense that um, we are not um, trying to um, necessarily record all of this data and give them a grade based off of this, but we're actually giving them some nudges to push them in the right direction. And um, the idea is that they get through the kind of a little bit more um, well-structured parts of the homework exercise this way using these learn our exercises but then also acknowledging that this is a little bit of a training wheels type of platform this is not how you really do data analysis this is maybe how you learn a little bit of our syntax so then going back to the homework assignment if you scroll down to that original homework assignment from 2019 i had a couple questions where 
uh, you know, you need to be in a free form R markdown document. They need to come up with a question. They need to come up with how to answer it. And things are a lot more open ended. So the idea is once they go through the structure automated feedback portion, we drop them into this. And so they have a shorter homework assignment that where they can answer the in-depth questions, but do so in that R markdown environment and submit things at a, as a GitHub repo still. Um, we're taking away some of the interaction that they're, some of the engagement that's happening in the R Studio IDE, but I hope that it's for a good reason that we're putting them in that learn R environment and um, helping them along the way a bit more than we would be able to with these static homework questions. The next thing is labs. So these are uh, the workshop hours that would be in person. I told you that they were two hours per week before. That's a really long time to be on Zoom for students is what we decided. So we're cutting them down to an hour and acknowledging that they're probably going to need a whole other hour, about an hour to like kind of actually get through the same material. They do these in teams. Um, and so we will be offering Zoom sessions like this uh, throughout the day for them to show up as teams. Uh, but we're going to have to provide an asynchronous option as well, just acknowledging that the synchronous option may not be available to every single student, uh, you know, calling in from everywhere. The final result is an R markdown report that they submit on GitHub. So here's an example of a lab they would have done in, on camp, uh, last year. We scraped data from the University of Edinburgh art collection and then we did some exploratory data analysis on the data that we scraped. So during the two hours, they would have done this in class. And what we're doing is taking these lab exercises and again, chunking them into what we expect them to do pre-lab, uh, some warm up activity as soon as we hit the breakout session button in Zoom, just so they're not just staring to see where to get started, to get the uh, conversation going with a few multiple choice questions. And then the bulk of the lab is business as usual, but you can now see that that's maybe a little bit more doable in an hour as opposed to the full two hours. And then probably letting them know that we don't expect you to finish during this hour. Here is the bit you might be able to do uh, on your own because it's based on material you've learned previously. The challenging things here is going to be support during the uh, breakout sessions, I think. And also like, uh, will they actually have the technology and the motivation to meet outside of class? I don't know. So to quickly wrap things up, they also have quizzes that they do. These are also learn our quizzes and we get to collect data on them. And uh, I'm going to continue to call office hours. Um, and we're also going to do these code along sessions. I have no idea how. I've never done really live coding online with my students before, but I decided I can learn from the best. So there are a bunch of people who do live coding weekly online and I enjoy watching their videos. So I'm hoping to take some cues from them. Um, I'm going to be posting all of these on YouTube and just turn on community captioning to make sure that we actually get the subtitles on all the videos that we generate. I don't know how to assess effectiveness of this, but I feel like it will at least uh, create some engagement hours. And finally, the projects will stay the same as um, uh, projects that they do in Teams. The only difference being that they can either come in and present on a Zoom session or make pre-recorded videos and we're working on instructions to uh, let them uh, help them do that. Managing the team dynamics will probably be uh, very uh, challenging as well. That's another thing that's keeping me up at night. So I'm hoping to see, maybe we'll hear from other speakers about uh, the approaches they're taking for those. The slides are at the top link and um, the first of the bottom links, the introds.org is where I post my course materials here at the university. And then the next one is a project I maintain with all open source materials for all of the things that I've been talking that we're developing. Um, so you can kind of follow up and reuse the materials as you like from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mina. I, I think we're going to hand over to um, Chris now for some questions. Chris, are you with us? Uh, sorry, I was muted. I am there. Yeah, so we have a couple of... Thanks for the lovely talk, Mina. Uh, so we have a couple of questions in the, in the box. I'll read those out. So first, you have a question from Debbie Yuster. What do you think about fixed student groups versus switching around groups regularly? 
Um, so I have always worked with um, fixed student groups and the reason for that is the end of semester project. So it's really difficult to function very well in a group, I think. So you need some time with lower stakes assessments um, that they, where they get to learn each other until they get to the final project, which is a bigger deal, both in terms of time invested and also the percentage of uh, marks that are worth. Um, so and for the online version, I I think we will definitely stick to that because one of the considerations that we have to keep in mind is time zones where uh, folks are dialing in from if they're not locally here. So I think managing all of that and changing them around would be hard. So I'm hoping to cluster students in a way where they can easily meet with each other. Thanks. Some other some other questions coming in. Um, a one to one question. Uh, from Phil here, could you explain what your asynchronous option is? How it differs? Was, was that a lot of extra work to have these two paths? So the asynchronous option is mostly going to uh, come into play in those lab sessions. Um, and the um, the asynchronous option will have like my opening video from the synchronous session, like a 10 minutes of me introducing what today's challenge is, task is. I'm going to stop recording at that point because there's no point in recording folks' breakout sessions. Um, the lab uh, documentation, even if you read the ones from last year, are actually written out very precisely, like every step they need to take. Um, so actually it's not too much extra work for me i think it is going to be extra work for the students so um i should have mentioned along with the uh time zone for making up teams another question that i'm going to be asking at my pre-course survey or like first week survey for the courses are you planning to show up to the synchronous lab sessions because somebody might be in a funny time zone but wanting to call in versus somebody may not actually be able to so we're going to cluster students that way and um, because they all work on github uh, they always had an opportunity to push collectively to these team repositories so from a technical standpoint we're not actually um, uh, having to change a whole lot on that perspective. Whether that'll be enjoyable for students, I don't know yet. <laughs> Ellen, do we have time for further questions or? Yeah, I think we have time for one, maybe even two more questions actually. Oh, great, fantastic, thank you. So, um, well, what, so one question is about how you support the breakout group. So uh, Mintu asks, what's the class size for the course? And could you say something about the size of breakout groups and how you support the breakout groups. So, um, so the size of the course is 300 students is what we're budgeting for. However, for the workshop sessions, the lab sessions, which is the only thing where students are going to be in breakout groups, we're gonna do 100 at a time. Um, the students are in teams of three to five, mostly four people, but three to five. Um, and the goal is to have for these 100 students, and if you imagine uh, four people per team, that makes about 25 breakout groups at the same time. We hope to have five uh, people online, so myself and four other tutors. So we're going to be using the tutoring time more for these, and that's why the emphasis on moving a lot of things to kind of automated feedback and automated marking so we can make up time out of thin air. Uh, because I think one of the most challenging things about running these sessions um, online is going to be that you don't have the visual for the room anymore. You don't see people who are clearly on Facebook. You don't get to talk to a team um, and then have another team listen into you. You kind of have to repeat yourself more. So it takes more human resources to manage it. Um, I imagine a little bit of um, wrinkles along the way at the very beginning. Uh, but we will also actively visit breakout groups and not wait for students to call for help, especially during the first few weeks, so that they get used to us, you know, coming into their breakout group and answering questions and leaving so that they can continue to ask for help. Great, thank you very, very much, Amina. And I know there are other questions in the Q&A, so uh, perhaps if you feel uh, that you want to, you could potentially uh, answer those questions in there. Will do. Thank, so, you. thank you. 